Welcome, everybody, to the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy. I'm Father Chris Alar, and today we appreciate your patience as our live broadcast at 11 a.m. had to be delayed um, as we will pray in a moment. Um, we, I was speaking with the father of an employee um, that um, has passed away and it's been a tragic situation for our Marian family. And we ask for your prayers for Mark. Um, Mark this morning um, took his life and we are very saddened, um, praying for his family. And I dedicate this Divine Mercy Sunday to him. And I was gonna cancel this talk altogether, but my provincial superior said no. We wanna make sure that there's not other souls um, that are troubled, that don't have a chance to hear God's grace and mercy. So he instructed me to do this. And the father of Mark, um, God bless him, stated that Father Chris, I have but one request, please ask the Marian helpers to pray for Mark. And um, this was an employee that was a very good man. And uh, so we offer him up in prayers. But we will try to get through this talk on the importance of Divine Mercy Sunday and the grace. Probably any other topic I would not be doing tonight. Um, we would just have canceled. But this is that important to celebrate Divine Mercy Sunday tomorrow. So let us begin with a prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask you to please have mercy on all of us for those who are troubled, that they might find consolation physically, emotionally, or spiritually. We ask that all those who are struggling with any suicidal tendencies that you may show them the beauty and the, and the gift that you have given through your grace and that you are, that you love them and that you care for them and us as well. We ask that Mark, you have mercy on this employee of ours and allow him to share in your divine promise of eternity. And we ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so as I mentioned, I think this would be the only topic. If this was not the eve of Divine Mercy Sunday, I would not be doing this. So let us see the importance of this day tomorrow and so that anybody who is hurting may be healed before any other tragedies. This is the benefit of being a Marian helper. This is the beauty of being a part of our Marian family. We pray for each other. And I ask for your prayers for Mark. I ask for your prayers for his family. Um, I know you guys are prayer warriors. I know so many of you by name, or at least screen name, as I always say. And so we are praying for you and thank you for your prayers. For Mark, eternal rest grant unto him, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon him. May his soul and the soul of all the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. Okay, thank you for joining us today. We will be speaking about how to receive the graces of Divine Mercy Sunday. As you saw on the slide, Divine Mercy Sunday explained. Such a powerful grace. Now let's show our next slide. And in this next slide, we have a powerful quote to ponder. Jesus said, souls perish in spite of my bitter passion, but I am giving them the last hope of salvation. That is the feast of my mercy. If they will not adore my mercy, they will perish for all eternity. Secretary of my mercy, write, tell all souls about this great mercy of mine because the awful day, the day of my justice is near. Paragraph 965. You know, there's so much a warning in our Lord to not let this grace pass by. 
He said, if you don't pass through the doors of my mercy, you must pass through the doors of my justice. And as I always say, I don't know about you, but I need the doors of mercy. I'm not making it through the doors of justice. And so John Paul II said, there's nothing the world needs more than divine mercy. And he consecrated the world to it. You know, what is divine mercy? Okay, you've heard me say in some of our other talks, all these other explanations of divine mercy. It's loving the unlovable and forgiving the unforgivable. It's a particular mode of love that when love encounters suffering, it takes action to do something about it. But one of the things that I wanted to talk about that I have not mentioned before is the Trinity in the sense that the perfect love between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, when that perfect love that was always shared within the Trinity poured outside of itself, we have divine mercy. Because that mercy is divine, it's from God, and when that perfect love between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, remember, the Holy Spirit is simply the love between the Father and the Son. Father and the Son, the love between them is so great, it actually is the Holy Spirit. But when that love poured outside of itself, we got mercy. Now, what do you mean, Father, poured outside of itself? Creation. When he created man and the angels and the universe. And so this is powerful, very important. Now, this is what mercy is. It can be affective with an A, meaning that you have pity for the plight of another, but you don't do anything about it. You're just sorry, like kind of like we see on television. Or mercy can be effective, taking steps then to actually do something about the suffering. And so this is important. Now, love is therefore not just words. Remember, mercy is the highest form of love. That particular mode of love that when love encounters suffering, it takes action to do something about it. It goes from affective, meaning, gee, I'm sorry, to effective with an E, meaning I'm going to do something about it. And this is what we have in mercy. So love is not just words, but actions. I can tell you all day long I love you, but if you call upon me and I'm never there for you, those actions speak loudly. So God wanted to show us his love through action. What action did his mercy take? His love poured out into creation. Then we got broken. So what action did he take then? He sent his son for redemption. Then, it, then after we redeemed, what action did he take? Holy Spirit sanctified us. A whole nother talk, but that's the power. And so the incarnation of God becoming a man was the ultimate effective mercy becoming action. So divine mercy is not just something, but somebody, the very person of Jesus himself. That's why our title is the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy. Not just the National Shrine of Divine Mercy. That would mean the attribute adjective, like, you know, God is merciful. But we are the national shrine of the divine mercy, meaning Jesus, the person himself. Now, Jesus said, I have a new book out called Understanding Divine Mercy. And people always say to me, Father, you can't understand divine mercy. You're correct. If you're talking about God and his essence. But Jesus said to St. Faustina that we can come to know him through his attributes. So here is where the attribute now, not the person, the adjective, God is merciful. His attribute of mercy can help us to come to know him as the person, the divine mercy. What do I mean? All right. All God's attributes are infinite. Um, he is omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing. But God's mercy is his greatest attribute. Why? Because it's the most important one for us. Yeah, that's good for me that God's omniscient and knows everything. But it's way better for me that he's all merciful. And that is my salvation. The fact that all God is all knowing isn't going to give me salvation. In fact, it could prevent me from salvation. But the fact that God is all merciful, that leads me to salvation. So that's why it's his greatest attribute in regard to us. Now, Jesus exclaimed he wanted a feast to honor his mercy, which the world had forgotten about. There actually was 
ancient feasts. St. Augustine used to talk about the, Saint, the, the Sunday in white. And he had forgotten about these. And he said that it had to be on the Sunday after Easter. Why? Why did Jesus say this feast has to be on the Sunday after Easter? Because it completes what we call the octave. Now, I am going to explain a little duplicate from my homilies this week, but don't hang up. Don't close out because this is just a little recap. And then I'm going to go into new stuff. But stay with me for the recap. Father, I've already heard this. Okay, yeah, I mentioned it in the homily or two, but we're going to recap it, and then we're going to go on to new stuff. All right, now, here's the thing. By completing, by Jesus saying, I want this feast on the eighth day, he's completing an octave, a big feast. Now, when a feast was so big for the Jews that it couldn't be celebrated in one day, it was too big, they celebrated it over eight days. And this is what Jesus is saying, I want divine mercy on the eighth day. There's a huge meaning here. All right, now, we have only two octaves left in the church. We used to have many, but only two are left since the reform and the missal, and that is Christmas and Easter. For instance, the Christmas octave begins on Christmas Day, the 25th, and eight days later ends on January 1st, Mary, the mother of God. It's all one day. It's called Christmas. And the reason it's all one day is because you can't separate Jesus, the beginning of the octave, Christmas, from Mary, the end of the octave, January 1st. They're connected. You can't separate Jesus from Mary. So this is what we celebrate in Christmas. Now, the biggest octave we have is Easter. Now, this is the perfect example of the perfect feast because Easter is the biggest celebration we have in the church. Now, what is the perfect number in the Bible? The answer is seven. So why did Jesus ask for divine mercy eight days after Easter? So he said, okay, you have Easter Sunday and I want divine mercy Sunday eight days later. Why didn't he say seven days later? And therefore the perfect number to the Jews. Well, seven was the perfect number in regards to time or creation. <clears throat> but, <clears throat> but the perfect number to the Jews in regards to eternity, not time on earth, but eternity, meaning after your time on earth, is the number eight. So Jesus said, I want this Easter octave to start with Easter Sunday. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's day one. Easter octave, day one, Monday, and that's Sunday, so you have Easter Sunday, day one, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Divine Mercy Sunday. Now, this eight days is important because while seven is the perfect number for time and creation, eight represents the Jewish eternity. Now, as I said, Easter's day one. And what happened on Easter? Jesus opened the door to heaven. We were all redeemed. Jesus on Easter Sunday brought us a new creation. We are redeemed. The next seven days are symbolic of our time on earth, creation, time. And that is symbolic of your life. So on Easter Sunday, day one, Jesus opened the door to heaven. The next seven days are symbolic of your time here on earth, your pilgrimage, like the Jews in the desert. That is your time on earth. Now, when the Jews were in the desert, what were they looking for? The promised land. We too are wandering around in our seven days on earth looking for heaven. That is our promised land. Now, the Easter octave, as I said, is Easter Sunday to Divine Mercy Sunday. And this completes Easter. It fulfills Easter. And listen to this. Since Jesus opened the door to heaven, everybody's redeemed. But will everybody be saved? <clears throat> no. Some souls are lost because they choose to be. Now, here's the thing. 
The fact that Jesus opened the door to heaven, his work is not yet finished until we walk through that door at the end of our life on the eighth day. So you see, Easter is beautiful. Nothing else happens without it. It's the high point because without Jesus redeeming us and open the door to heaven, nothing else happens. So we absolutely need to then keep going through our seven days. And then after our seven days, we enter into eternity. That eighth day is Divine Mercy Sunday. Now here's the thing. Once we go through it, we are saved. And once we are saved, we've now completed or fulfilled the reason for Easter Sunday. Now, on Easter Sunday, we are redeemed. That means everybody has a chance to be saved. But on Divine Mercy Sunday, we are all saved who choose to accept the grace. You enter in through the door of heaven. So Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas says there are two perfections. And he said that actually, and this goes back to Augustine, that actually the eighth day of the octave is actually the greatest day. St. Augustine actually said that the eighth day is the compendium of the days of mercy. And the compendium of the days of mercy means it's the great day. Why? Again, because it is a perfection of Easter. It fulfills it. Why? Okay, St. Thomas Aquinas said everything has a perfection and then a second perfection. What does he mean by that? Our first perfection is the fact that we exist. You're a human being. You walk, you talk, you communicate, you love, you work, you pray. You have a perfection as a human being. But the second and greater perfection is when something becomes that which it was created for. So when an acorn becomes an oak tree, it's reached its perfection. It becomes that which it was created for. If you crush an acorn, an acorn has a, a certain perfection because it exists. But if you crush it with a hammer before it becomes an oak tree, it didn't realize its full potential. It didn't become what it was created to become, an oak tree. We too are humans, but why were we created? Baltimore Catechism, to know God, to love him and serve him and be with him forever in heaven. Once we achieve that, we have become what we were created for. That is why they said that divine mercy, or excuse me, the eighth day is the greatest of the days. Now, it doesn't replace Easter. They're the same day. The whole eight days of the octave are celebrated as one day, not separate days. It completes it. It fulfills it. It's like the front end and the back end. It's like together. Now, here's what's important. Now, St. Augustine called it the greatest day. All right, now, let me read you this. This is a quote from St. Thomas the Apostle in some of the earliest writings we have called the Apostolic Constitutions. Oh, Lord, basically, well, actually, you know what? Um, through St. Faustina, we could see that St. Thomas the Apostle was the earliest example of this in writing, a liturgical document called the Apostolic Constitutions. And this is where we say, quote, this is from Thomas the Apostle. After eight days, following the Feast of Easter, this is Thomas the Apostle talking, the earliest writings we have called the Apostolic Constitutions. After eight days, following the Feast of Easter, let there be another feast observed with honor on the eighth day itself, on which he gave me Thomas, who was hard of belief, full assurance by showing me the print of the nails and the wound made by his side, in his side by the spear. Now listen to this. St. Gregory of Nazianzen, a great church doctor, one of the greatest, also supported this feast by declaring the octave of Easter is even greater 
than the Feast of Easter, though it takes nothing away from it. And again, I don't claim this because I see they're the same. They're part of the same octave. They're the same day. But he says it's greater than Easter, although it takes nothing away from the greatness of the day of Easter and resurrection. He said, here's why. Easter Sunday is the boundary between death and life, a creation. But the eighth day, the octave, is the fulfillment of what Easter is all about. Perfect life and eternity. A second creation, more admirable and more better than the first. That's powerful stuff. All right, now, before we can enter into heaven, however... God bless Mark, right? Before we enter into heaven, we must be spotless. Like a Jewish groom who wants his bride to be spotless before he takes her home to meet his mother and his father. We need to be spotless. Now, who is the groom? You've heard me say this, Jesus. Who is the bride? We are the church. All right, so on the eighth day, Jesus will come to claim his bride. What is your eighth day? The day of your death. You finished your seven-day pilgrimage. On your eighth day, you die. You enter into eternity. And Jesus is going to claim his bride and want to take you back to meet God as Father, God the Father, and Mary his mother. But there may be stains. All right? There might be stains on this wedding garment of ours called our soul. That might prevent us from getting into heaven. Now, I think I missed a couple slides of St. Thomas and St. Gregory of Nazianzen. So if Mark didn't get, Brother Mark didn't get those up, that's okay. Let's go to the next slide when I ask the question, if that stain is on our wedding garment, how do we get rid of it? Look on your screen, confession. This is the confessional. Now, there may be two stains on our wedding garment, as I said, the soul, and this may prevent us from getting to heaven. Now, our first stain is sin, and that wipes away in the confessional. That wipes away. If this is in our confessional that we can give and get freed from all sin, when we come out of the confessional, we are forgiven. We are guaranteed forgiveness. Our sin is forgiven if we have a valid confession. Now, here's the question. Is the priest the one who forgives your sins? Yes, actually. It is the priest who forgives your sins. Now, people say, no, Father, that's not true. Actually, it is. Matthew 18, 18, John 16, 19, Excuse me, I should say Matthew 16, 19. John 20, 23. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven. Whose sins you retain are retained. You see, when you have ultimate authority, which Jesus did on earth, you have the power to delegate it. You have the power to delegate it. And Jesus gave that power to the first priest who then ordained the next priest and gave them the power. Since they had the power to forgive sins, delegated from Jesus who had ultimate power, when they ordained the next priest, they had the power to forgive sins. Now, the grace doesn't come from them. It only comes from God, but it goes through the priests. If you have ultimate authority, you have the power to delegate it. Now, all sins can be forgiven in the confessional. All sins, except one. Sin against the Holy Spirit. All other sins, as I always say, lying, stealing, abortion, murder, all other sins can be forgiven. But one cannot sin against the Holy Spirit. You know what that sin is? Not asking for mercy. So when we go to confession, our sins are guaranteed forgiven. When that priest raises his hand and says, I absolve you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, you are guaranteed forgiveness or Jesus wasn't telling the truth when he said, whose sins you forgive are forgiven. But what about the punishment for our sins? What about the punishment? Does the punishment stay or remain? What I mean by punishment are the consequences of our sins. Now, the eternal punishment to sin is gone. Hell, a.k.a. hell, wiped away. When you go to come out of the confessional, you no longer face the fires of hell as long as you are in a state of grace and you don't commit another mortal sin. 
This is guaranteed because the sacraments are guaranteed grace. When the priest says, I absolve you, heaven has to follow it because Jesus said, who sins you forgive are forgiven. So if you go to the priest and he says, I forgive you, Jesus said, if you forgive them, they are forgiven in heaven. And so the priest, when he forgives you, it's guaranteed. Now, that eternal punishment is gone, but what about the temporal punishment? This may remain. Sin has consequences, and we must make restitution for those after we sin. It's kind of like breaking the window, and then the boy is grounded afterwards because his dad said, don't play baseball in the front yard. He does, breaks the window. Then the dad says, you're forgiven, but you got to pay for this out of your allowance. There's a temporal punishment. Now, if we don't, if we don't make restitution, then we owe back this punishment. Now we have a choice. We can remove that punishment in this world or we can have to do it in purgatory. You don't want to wait. Now, how do we do it in this world? There's several ways. I'm just going to focus on one. We can do a plenary indulgence to forgive the sin and remove the punishment. Now, let's look at our next slide. Okay, now our next slide shows examples of plenary indulgences that you can do every day. Again, what's a plenary indulgence? It forgives sins and all the punishment. But let's look at an example. If you do adoration for 30 minutes, you can get a plenary indulgence. If you do stations of the cross any day of the year, not just Lent, you can get a plenary indulgence. If you pray a rosary inside a church or chapel or with another person, you can get a plenary indulgence. And if you're reading scripture for 30 minutes, you could do this on your couch, you can get a plenary indulgence. But here's what's, what needs to be known. Look at our next slide. There are four conditions. So let's put up our next slide. There's four conditions for a plenary indulgence that we must do to get it. You have to ask for it, right? So one, you receive Holy Communion. Now, before that, really, number two should be one. You go to confession about 20 days before or after you do the indulgence act, like praying a rosary or doing the stations or reading the Bible or doing adoration. You have then 20 days that you can go to confession for that one indulgence. One confession covers up to 20 indulgence days that you do before or after. Now, if you're not in a state of grace, you got to go before. If you're in a state of grace, you could go before or after. Now, this confession is a requirement. You need to do it. Now, third, pray for the intentions of the Holy Father. That's usually in our Father, Hail Mary, Glory Be. But notice the fourth one, no attachment to sin, even venial. Now, that's not easy. That's not easy. So, in these that last condition sinks most people. Good luck, because we all struggle with sin. We all have problems with sin. This is a struggle. I'm impatient sometimes. I'm gluttonous sometimes. So what do we do? If God comes for us, as Jesus comes for us as his groom on the eighth day, and we're the bride, and he finds us with stain, either sin, if you got that, get to the confessional, or punishment, you're not ready to go to heaven. Revelation, I think it's 21, 27, says nothing impure will enter heaven. So we got to get cleaned up. Now, if we've got our sin forgiven in the confessional, we still might have punishment. Now, I just told you a way to get rid of it. It's called a plenary indulgence, but it's not easy because a lot of us have attachment to sin. So when Jesus comes for his bride on the eighth day, when we each die, he's going to be finding not a lot of us ready. And so what does he do? He wants us all to be ready. He doesn't want some of us to be ready. And so what does he do? He gives us one more way. Let's look at our slide. Divine Mercy Sunday. This is incredible. And in that gift of Divine Mercy Sunday, we have something very special. This is something, and let's look at our next slide the extraordinary promise. Now, right after Divine Mercy Sunday, let's look at our next slide called the Feast of Divine Mercy. Here is this extraordinary promise that Jesus gives a remedy for those people who are still struggle with attachments, brokenness. I still have some addiction. I still have, you know, my temper. I still have lustful thoughts. How can we enter heaven? God gives us another way. 
He wants us in heaven so bad, he makes this promise on the feast of divine mercy. And let's read this promise. On that day, what day? Divine Mercy Sunday. The very depths of my tender mercy are open. I pour out a whole ocean of graces upon those souls who approach the fount of my mercy. Here it is. Don't miss it. This is the extraordinary promise. The soul that will go to confession and receive holy communion shall obtain complete forgiveness forgiveness of sins and punishment. So any of us, any of us can crawl out of the gutter, go to confession, receive Holy Communion, and receive a complete wipement, cleaning, totally cleaning. If we do, our souls are wiped completely clean, and this day is tomorrow. This day is tomorrow. All sin and punishment is completely gone. Never will our souls be cleaner other than the moment of our original baptism than they are on Divine Mercy Sunday. And then we can enter into heaven. Then when Jesus comes on the eighth day for his bride, we are ready. Our spouse can come get us and take us home. This is it. All right, now, you need to do something, though. Now, Jesus did not give this command. I'm going to show you the next slide as something to do to receive the grace because we must ask for it. And people are like, Father, how do I ask for it? I'm going to tell you. Right now, let's put up our next slide. This is a prayer to receive the graces of Divine Mercy Sunday. Now, please, this is on tape. When you watch it, you can, we're going to post it after it's here live. It will remain on tape so you can push pause at the end of the live broadcast and it will stay on your screen. You can copy it down or read it. But here or this or your own prayer, it doesn't have to be this exact prayer. I wrote this, but you can do your own. Let's read what Jesus says or excuse me, what the prayer to request this grace says. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, you promised St. Faustina that the soul that has been to confession, I have. And the soul that receives holy communion with trust in divine mercy, I have. Will receive the complete forgiveness of all sins and punishment. Lord, please give me this grace. Jesus, I trust in you. This is a powerful prayer. And now let's take just 36 seconds or whatever it is to watch a quick clip of a video of Father Seraphim talking about what our Lord wants in this devotion called Divine Mercy. Let's take a quick look at Father Seraphim. God rest his soul too. So what do you think the Lord is really asking us to do in this devotion, Father? I believe what our Lord is really asking is that we concentrate on his great love that he did not hesitate to give his life for us. And this will prompt us to respond to his love to us. And I think we have to keep in mind what the real meaning of devotion is. It's not just pious practice. Devotion means that you are given with your whole life to someone for what he means to you. And this is what we must understand here. Oh, God bless you, Father Seraphim. We miss you too. You know, a lot of people will ask, well, Father, in that promise it says go to confession and receive holy communion i got two questions people say to me what if i can't get to the church what if i'm quarantined or sick or the church is closed okay instead of confession you make an act of contrition just telling god that you're sorry and that you'll try to do better amend your life leave sin behind change what you do and live following him Secondly, people say, well, Father, what about Holy Communion? Okay, if you can't again get to the church because it's closed, or if you cannot um, leave your house because you're quarantined, make a spiritual communion. Just telling God to come into your heart as if you did receive him in the Blessed Sacrament. Unite with you. Be united with you just like you were in Holy Communion. Now, this is why it could apply to even non-Catholics, because even non-Catholics, although they don't have the guaranteed grace of our sacraments, we have it guaranteed. That's why you want to be Catholic. But God doesn't shut his mercy out from non-Catholics if they make an act of contrition, just telling God they're sorry and they repent, and they ask to be united with him in their heart, kind of like we are guaranteed in communion, 
they too can ask for this grace on this day. Now, remember though, this extraordinary grace is only for yourself. People say, well, I want to give it to holy soul. No, a plenary indulgence can be given for holy soul or yourself. But this promise of Divine Mercy Sunday is only for ourselves. All right, now, the church does, however, offer a plenary indulgence on Divine Mercy Sunday. I know this gets confused. If you do an act of mercy or some act of devotion, such as generate, venerating the image or praying the chaplet, you can get a plenary indulgence also offered on this day. Now, however, people say, I'm confused, Father. They are different. Both give complete forgiveness of sins and punishment. The difference is the plenary indulgence has the condition you can have no attachment to sin, whereas the extraordinary promise does not. It just simply says, come to confession, receive Holy Communion. There's no other conditions. Anybody can receive this grace. You, especially the Catholics who go to the sacraments, it's just basic, it's not a magic wand or a rabbit's foot. It's basically Jesus calling you back to the sacraments. This is powerful. So what I do, do a two for one tomorrow. Do an act of veneration of the image or pray the chaplet and ask for a plenary indulgence. Offer that for a holy soul. Then at the same time, having been to confession or make an act of contrition and receive holy communion or make a spiritual act of communion, ask for the grace of the prayer we just read. Lord, give me the grace. You said the soul that goes to confession I have, the soul that receives holy communion I just did. Give me this grace and you'll get the extraordinary promise of complete forgiveness of sin and punishment for yourself. So you can do a two for one tomorrow. You can do a plenary indulgence for a holy soul and the extraordinary promise for yourself. This is incredible. Only God could be so great. So, you know, to finish on this, what is the difference between a plenary indulgence and the extraordinary promise? Well, first of all, the plenary indulgence both requires confession but in the plenary indulgence, it has to be within 20 days. Divine Mercy Sunday is just sometime near the feast where you're in a state of grace. It doesn't have a daytime limit or a number of days limit. Now, next, the indulgence is given by the church in her authority. That's good. But Divine Mercy Sunday grace, this extraordinary promise, was given directly by God. Right through St. Faustina. All right, here's another one. In a plenary indulgence... It's the removal of all temporal punishment due to sins that you've already been forgiven for, like that you've confessed. Whereas Divine Mercy Sunday removes the sins when you go to confession, but all the punishment for every sin you've ever committed, even the sins you forgot to confess. It's greater than a plenary indulgence. Finally, the indulgence, you have to have the attachment, or excuse me, the condition of no attachment to sin, even venial. And you know what? Divine Mercy Sunday says, even with imperfect contrition, where we're still struggling with attachments, we receive it. It's like a second baptism. Never will our souls be cleaner than other than the moment of Divine Mercy Sunday. All right, now, I'm almost done here. We're going to finish within an hour today, a little shorter talk. But, you know, um, Father um, Rozitsky made a powerful statement, and he said, Ordinarily, only the sacrament of baptism affects in the soul complete forgiveness of sins and punishment. Reception of the Holy Eucharist in a state of grace ordinarily remits only venial sin. Remember, it's forgiven in the Mass. While strengthening the soul both against venial and mortal sin. So in other words, baptism forgives the sin and the punishment, but the Eucharist only venial sin. Now, he says, on Mercy Sunday, however, Holy Communion received worthily now takes on the power of baptism. So instead of just giving normally the forgiveness of venial sins, it also does what baptism does and forgives sins and all punishment. And he says, when we receive it worthily and with trust, God's mercy pours out upon the soul a complete renewal of baptismal grace. Wow. All right, last page. We can prepare for Divine Mercy Sunday. Basically, or I should say, 
we can prepare for union with God every day, in this world, through the Mass. You've heard me say before, the Mass is the wedding feast of the Lamb, and when we come up the aisle for Holy Communion, you've heard me say, we are the bride who's waiting for us at the altar, the groom. You've heard me say, when the bride and groom, that night of the marriage that's consummated, the groom enters into the bride, same with us at Holy Communion. The groom, Jesus, literally through the Eucharist, enters us to, into us, the bride. And at the altar, we meet him. Now, this is the promise of Divine Mercy Sunday. It's basically taking you back to the sacraments, that you receive him in the sacraments. So when he comes as that groom for you, the bride, at the end of your life, the eighth day, symbolized by Divine Mercy Sunday, you're cleansed, you're purified, you're without stain of sin. This is incredible. Now, forgiveness, this is, now I'm going to skip, change gears here a little bit. People don't understand the power of confession, which is one of the requirements for Divine Mercy Sunday. And I want to say this, forgiveness of sin is actually a greater act, according to the theologians, than all of the creation of the universe. Do you know that when you walk into that confessional for one confession and you come out, you're like, oh, okay. Do you know that a greater act just happened than the creation of the entire universe? You know why? Because it is an act with an eternal effect. It affects you all the way into eternity. Creation doesn't. Creation stops in this world. So how incredible is that, that confession is greater than creation. This is Thomas Aquinas. So when you go into that confessional, what just happened when you were forgiven is a greater act than the creation of the universe because it has an eternal effect. The effect goes into eternity. Creation of the universe does not go into eternity. And so confession is a greater act. And do you know confession is actually greater than an exorcism? Because it's a sacrament. Guaranteed grace, whereas an exorcism is just a sacramental. People are like, Father, i got to drive a thousand miles to a priest who can exorcise me. Confession is actually greater. This is why our Lord on Divine Mercy Sunday, it's simply a return to the sacraments. It's not a magic wand. It's not a rabbit's foot. It's a return to the sacraments. This is beautiful. So it's not just forgiveness of sin, but also punishment, and it's God meeting our needs. His mercy, which mercy becomes, it's effective, meaning it has pity, but now God's mercy becomes effective in the incarnation, and now Jesus becomes the divine mercy, the living person. This is amazing. His mercy. You know, how incredible are we to receive this grace and on this one day tomorrow to have it even that much more powerful? If it couldn't be powerful enough, it's already infinitely powerful. But our Lord adds to that the complete forgiveness of also all sin. You know, in many ways, Jesus used St. Faustina, and I want to quote one quick, and we've only got about 10 minutes left, but I think it's worth mentioning Dr. Robert Stackpole, who works for us here as a theologian, actually did some of his work in, in grad school on whether or not divine mercy is quote unquote optional or not. And what he pointed out in the Missal is very powerful. Do you know in the Roman Missal, it uses the Latin word seau, S-E-U if I remember him saying correctly. And that was translated into the English to mean or. Now here's the problem. Many priests will open up the Missal on Divine Mercy Sunday, and what does it say? The second Sunday of Easter or Divine Mercy Sunday. Now they take that to mean, well, it's optional. I can celebrate it or not. But Thomas Aquinas talks about words that are equivocal and univocal. Now, for instance, if I had for lunch today an apple or an orange, I'm talking about two different things. But what's parked out in that parking lot? Is that a car or an automobile? You see, the word 
is equivocal. It could mean multiple things. And so, or it could mean the same thing. So let me give you an example of what Dr. Robert Stackpole said it actually should say. The proper translation is really Divine Mercy Sunday, namely, or excuse me, the second Sunday of Easter, namely Divine Mercy Sunday. Or he says, the second Sunday of Easter, that is Divine Mercy Sunday. Amazing. You know, the sacred congregation for divine worship in April of 2000 formalized the declaration of Divine Mercy Sunday, and listen to this, and by its inclusion in the Roman Missal, made it binding through the universal church. Pray for your priests if they're not speaking on mercy tomorrow, because they should. It's a beautiful day. The readings do as well. All right, we got just a little bit left. Let's look at our next slide. Here is a picture of John Paul. And this picture here is a beautiful gift that he was to the church. And John Paul II canonized her in the year 2000. At that time, he had a meeting with Sumerian priests and brothers. Now, I only got this secondhand because I wasn't a Marian. But he said that many of the reasons that he was made Pope, he believed, was to carry on this mission of mercy. Basically, to canonize St. Faustina and to institute the Feast of Divine Mercy. Now, what he actually did say, and he was quoted, was, this is the happiest day of my life. That's what Dave Kame told me, our former editor. A beautiful statement. You think of all the things that Pope John Paul did, all he wrote, all he said, all he did, and he says Divine Mercy Sunday, or the, the day of the declaration and the canonization of St. Faustina was the happiest day of his life. Wow. So anyway, him and St. Faustina definitely brought divine mercy to the world. Father Seraphim actually did a lot to complete it. And you know, St. Faustina wrote about Divine Mercy Sunday, seeing her canonization. And there's a passage in the diary that you may not be familiar with. When she saw what we believe was her own canonization, she described that she saw the Holy Father and she was seeing this vision. And she said, it says in the diary, between the altar and the Holy Father, she saw St. Peter. And St. Peter said something to John Paul. Well, I'm sorry, the, the Holy Father. We know now it was John Paul, but she didn't. And after that, right after that, he declared the feast of divine mercy. So could it have been possibly a Confirmation for the Holy Father to declare it that day? We don't know, but I think it's a beautiful passage in the diary. Now, here's the one thing too also. Do you know when John Paul II died and Cardinal Jeevich, one of his right-hand men for years, came to our shrine a few years ago. And I remember talking with him and he, he, he told the story of John Paul. And I don't know if many people realize, they always say, well, he died the day before Divine Mercy. Do you know, actually he had already celebrated Saturday morning mass and he wasn't planning on celebrating mass again until the following day, Divine Mercy Sunday. And John, uh, Cardinal Jeevich said it was put on his heart to celebrate mass with John Paul. And he said at first he ignored it and then the prompting of the Holy Spirit kept coming. And then he said, yeah. And he celebrated, but by this time it was past 5.30. Father Kaz is with us in the back. I think it was like eight o'clock, Father Kaz, or 8.30 or something. And he celebrated mass for Divine Mercy Sunday with John Paul. And John Paul received Holy Communion and passed into eternity like 25 minutes later. What a beautiful gift that was to the church. So... To finish, here's a couple questions we always get. And I want to finish with a couple of these. How is it that there's not a contradiction between God's justice and his mercy? Here, I want to go back to Father Seraphim. Please pray for our church. We have seemed to become factioned. Or we seem to have the left side and the right side 
And although the Lord says the right hand shouldn't know what the left hand is doing, they seem to get into each other's way because the left hand or the one side of the church is all about God's mercy. That could lead to presumption. We have to realize that it's not a free ticket to sin. We must have rectification of the will. We must be willing to change our lives, to leave sin behind, and make a firm amendment to follow Christ as a disciple. Divine mercy is not a free ticket to sin, meaning, well, you know, I'm going to keep cheating on my taxes and, and um, you know, embezzling my, from my company or having my affair, and, you know, I'll get this grace. It's pretty good. We don't want to be presumptuous. On the other side, let us not be only justice, where there's no room for God's mercy. God is just, but he is mercy. And I want to take these words from Father Seraphim. Father Seraphim said there's no contradiction between God's justice and mercy. He said, of course, the greater the sinner, the greater right that he has to God's mercy. This is right in the diary. But here's what Father Seraphim said. And I thought this was interesting. Of course, we know that sin requires death because that's the wage of sin and Jesus paid that wage. We know that. And that was the justice. God's justice was met when Christ paid the debt on the cross. The wage of sin is death. Jesus paid it. But what was the result of that action was mercy. Now, here's what Father Seraphim says. And I'm quoting him. God rest his soul. But Father Seraphim told me as I was scribbling notes one night at dinner that God's justice demands that we be holy, perfect, and merciful. But only God has all three of those. <laughs> so how could God's justice demand that we be holy, perfect, and merciful if only God has all three of those? So he looked at me at the table and he says, so how do, we, how do we explain this? He said, but his mercy is the key. And Father Seraphim said, his mercy is the only way we can become perfect and holy. So he lifts us up through his mercy. He elevates us in perfection. What did we say was the greatest perfection that Father Seraphim taught us is when we become what we were created to be, to know God, to love him and serve him, to be happy with him forever in heaven. So he said that we are lifted up by God's mercy to be perfect. Then we can be holy as he is holy. Now we've met his justice by being merciful. I'm sitting there like, how come I don't think of these things, Father Seraph? <laughs> That's why he was who he was. So it doesn't contradict because he gives the soul what it wants and what it deserves. So his mercy is his justice. His mercy tempers his justice. He never gives us, though, what we fully deserve. He gives us what we want. And if the, you know, you talk about what we deserve, that's another question because let's look at our next slide. And I've only got two to go. In paragraph 1146, he says, I cannot punish even the greatest sinner if he makes an appeal to my compassion. But on the contrary, I justify him. Notice, just justify him in my unfathomable and unscrutable mercy. Let's look at our next slide after that. This is why Jesus said, and this is paragraph 1160, I have all eternity for punishing. So I am prolonging the time of mercy for the sake of sinners. But woe to them if they do not recognize this time of my visitation. And that leads to the next slide, diary 998. I am giving mankind the last hope of salvation that is recourse to my mercy. So let us watch one last 30 second video of Father Seraphim and have him explain to you that it prepares us for Christ's return. 
This is a powerful statement that Father Seraphim wrapped up in 36 seconds. Let's take a look at that video real quick. Since the whole message of divine mercy through Sister Faustina is to prepare the world for Christ's return, he's got his church, which is his bride, has to be without spot or wrinkle. And in this way, we have the church prepared for the return of the Lord, which according to uh, the revelations of Faustina is in a way imminent. Uh, but it's the sacraments that hasten the day of the Lord's return, as the scripture scholars point out to us. So God rest his soul, Father Seraphim, our mentor, our teacher, our patriarch, and our way to learn more about divine mercy. So in that, he has a lot of wisdom that is preparing us for Christ's return. Why? Again, so that we can be that spotless bride. As he said in the video, Christ is coming on the eighth day. Eight represents eternity. When you come up this aisle, you are the bride who's waiting for you, the groom. And at the end of our seven-day pilgrimage called life, we will enter into the eighth day called eternity. The octave is day one Easter. The next seven days are symbolic of our period of called walking through life in this valley of tears. But on the eighth day, eighth day, we will enter into eternity. And it is on that day that he comes for his bride. And like any Jewish man, he wants his bride to be spotless. And on that one day, we can be spotless. On that one day, we can wipe away all stain on our wedding garment, our soul of sin, get to confession, and the punishment that is due to sin will be wiped away, as Father Seraphim says, like a second baptism. It's not a second baptism. We don't get baptized twice but it's like a second baptism. And in that is an incredible grace. Please don't let this pass by tomorrow. If you've been tonight to the vigil mass, you've already received Holy Communion and you've already been to confession, so you were in a state of grace. Make that prayer we showed you, just asking God for the complete forgiveness of sin and punishment. Now, if you're going tomorrow, same thing. After having been to confession, so you're in a state of grace, or if you're home and you're not able because of quarantine, make an act of contrition. Then receive Holy Communion. If you are not able to get to church, it's closed or you're quarantined, make a spiritual act of communion that we talked about. Then you can also say, Lord, please give me this grace. And you will be cleansed, as Father Seraphim said, unlike any other time than your original baptism incredible. So I had a few questions that were sent to me before the talk between when we postponed it this morning. I'd like to answer just a couple. Father, can confession be any time before Divine Mercy Sunday, or does it have to be on Divine Mercy Sunday? No, it can be before, again, as long as you're in a state of grace. Don't receive unworthily, but make yourself, Catechism 1452 says, if you're not available to the confessional, you can't get there, make a spiritual act of contrition, and then have the intent to go back to confession when next available. Very powerful. So yes, confession can be before, as long as you're in a state of grace. Do you know St. Faustina? She went on the Saturday before. She didn't go to confession on Divine Mercy Sunday. So please don't think that has to be a requirement. Now communion has to be either tonight on the vigil or tomorrow, any mass, not just a 3 p.m. prayer service, but any mass. Next question I got. Father, does this grace cover only the sins of our past or can it also cover the future? No, unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. If you fall back into the gutter, you got to go back to the showers. So when we would finish football practice when I was in high school or wrestling practice, we'd hit the showers, we'd get cleaned up, and then some of us would still start throwing the football out on the, on the lot next to the school. And sometimes it would turn into tackle again. You have to go all the way back and get in the showers again. So yeah, unfortunately, you can't have this apply the rest of your life. It covers, it cleanses you from everything of your past as long as you have that rectification of the will. But if you go back and play in the mud, you got to get back in the showers. That is confession and then hopefully next Divine Mercy Sunday. All right, two more questions. Father, what if my church is closed? Well, we kind of just answered this. What if my church is closed or I'm not able to get to, the, um, uh, to, to confession or communion? 
again, make an act of contrition or an act of spiritual communion, asking God to forgive your sins or to come into your heart in spiritual communion, to be united with him as if you did receive him sacramentally. Powerful. And then finally, the last question is, so Father, it, could this also apply to non-Catholics? Okay, another question that I steal from Father Seraphim. Father Seraphim says, yes, it can apply to non-Catholics. I mentioned this at a homily on Wednesday and I got an email that said, Father, this is wrong. You can't be telling people, Jesus specifically said it's for Catholics. Let's be a little careful here. Yes, as Catholics, we have the guaranteed grace in confession and communion. So our grace is guaranteed through the sacraments. But God's mercy is for everyone. If you are a non-Catholic, do the same thing. Make an act of contrition, telling God you're sorry, and an act of spiritual communion. Unite with me, Lord, in the same way. And Father Seraphim used to teach that therefore the grace is available to everyone. So God bless you all, and thank you very much. Um, it's been an honor to be here, and you know, thank you for your prayers, for the repose of the soul of Father Seraphim, and today for Mark, as I talked about. God bless him, and his father asked, please, Father Chris, bring in the Marian Helper Army. Please ask for the prayers for Mark, and we're thankful that you did. God bless all of you. That's why we're Marian Helpers. 100,000 new members to this Marian army since COVID began. And that's the power of prayer. God bless you and thank you. And in fact, as a parting gift to you on Divine Mercy Sunday, Brother Mark, can you show the last slide? Um, I just finished a book called Understanding Divine Mercy. And even though I explained we can't totally understand divine mercy, God said, in my essence, you can't understand me, but you can come to know me through my attributes. That's mercy. We're offering a Divine Mercy Sunday special. So please take a look at the book there on your screen. You can get a copy of this book right now for any donation. This is our Divine Mercy Sunday special. So for any donation, you can get a copy of this book sent to you. Simply call one 800 Four six two seven four two six, and order the copy. You can get it for any donation plus five dollars for shipping. So a little shipping fee, and any amount that you wish to pay. So whatever you can afford. If you can't, God bless you. Let me know. Send me an email if you can't afford anything. God's been blessing us. We'll send you a copy. But you can get it right now for any donation or visit online at thedivinemercy.org/slash. UDM for understanding divine mercy. So hopefully you'll take advantage of that grace and share it with your loved ones. So again, on this very somber and day that we need God's mercy leading into the ultimate day of mercy, we also ask for all of you who are suffering at home in any way, emotionally, spiritually, or physically, that God's mercy will shower down upon you too. Know that you're in our prayers. That's the beautiful thing of being a Marian helper is we pray for each other. So when we are in need and we need prayers, you're there. And when you're in need and you're in prayers, you guys text me, you call me, you email me, and you set comments online, and we're praying for you. So the Lord is great, and tomorrow is the greatest of days. So may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and happy Divine Mercy Sunday. Hi, I'm Father Chris Aylar, and I'm excited to tell you about the completion of my newest project. It's been a long time in the making. It's called Understanding Divine Mercy, my new book from Marian Press that finally in one place, I feel, gives you the, all the answers of everything you need to know about God's divine mercy. In fact, it answers what is divine mercy, who is St. Faustina, and what message did God give her for the world? How about the Feast of Divine Mercy? And what do you have to do to receive the graces that Jesus promises on this one day of the year? 
We talk about the meaning of the image and how to pray the novena and how to understand the chaplet and what to do in the hour of mercy and much, much more. Answering questions like, why would a merciful God allow such suffering? So please, we hope that you'll pick up a copy of this book for you and your loved ones, because if you get the understanding of what God's mercy is, you will understand why Jesus said it's mankind's last hope of salvation. So please visit us at shopmercy.org or give us a call at 800-462-7426. Thank you and may Almighty God bless you.